Welcome everybody to today's session on emergency management. Um, I'd like to start off by um, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples on the call today. Today we've got some um, uh, three really uh, experienced uh, remote sensing and emergency management um, luminaries from our industry. I've worked with them all previously, and uh, I'd like to just introduce them if I can. Um, Raphael, are you online? Yes, I am. Hi. Excellent. Um, Raphael is an extensive background in satellite and earth observation, building remote sensing applications and data management tools, especially in the areas of risk mitigation and disaster recovery. He has been involved in many international initiatives to improve humanitarian action and disaster response. Robert, uh, I think I can see you, Robert. Are you? Yep. Your arm Afternoon, yep. everyone. <laughs> Robert, uh, currently strategic business development at Aerometrics, previous roles in consulting to several large agencies and corporations relating to strategy, situational appraisal, problem solving, technology migration. Um, he's had the experience, his experiences across healthcare, logistics, software development, and technology. His background covers sales, strategy, development, business management, data analytics, and he's currently completing a master's in data science. Uh, he, uh, he's, he wouldn't consider himself a trained GIS expert, but he's been in the, uh, he's been focusing on selected the, uh, the right tools and technologies to answer questions and problems. Um, he sees it all about the problems. Now, Nathan, coming from the West Coast, Nathan is an executive uh, director of NGIS Australia. Since commencing operations over 27 years ago, NGIS has grown to become a leading geospatial consultancy in the Asia Pacific region and partners with global leading technology companies such as Google and Planet. Nathan has 20 years experience in the geospatial industry, servicing clients across a wide range of sectors, including resources, agriculture, utilities, government and transport. More recently, Nathan was, has worked on a range of international projects focused on sustainability development goals, including climate change, biodiversity, sustainable resourcing and disaster risk reduction. And um, my experience with Nathan was we actually uh, won a couple of awards together for addressing Tropical Cyclone Pam a few years ago. So what I'd like to do today, um, because we've got quite a limited amount of time to actually uh, complete this panel session, is to actually do a, uh, a scenario. And so the scenario is based on uh, a real hurricane that hit the um, the east coast of the US in 2019. And in one of the words that is used more often than not when we're watching the news today, it was unprecedented. And unprecedented means that it actually formed in the, uh, uh, off the Bahamas and then basically went from the Atlantic Ocean up the east coast. The interesting thing for me as I observed this uh, hurricane is that it actually traveled such a long way from Florida. So when we consider looking at other countries, we sometimes lose sight of where latitudes are in relation to Australia. So this, uh, this particular hurricane followed from Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. And it intensified to a category five storm at around 30 degrees north. So if we go and align that with the Australian coastline, basically it hit the coast at Brisbane as a category four. And by the time it got to Sydney, it was a category five. And as it went on its merry way, it didn't start dropping below a category four until it left Melbourne. So when we think of that in the context of Australia, these storms are real and they are happening around the world now. And surely we should be able to have an, a, a, an open discussion about the what if, if it happened in Australia. So I'd like to, first of all, have a, a invite Raphael to, um, to be the first. And we'll say that we've got a, um, we've got a, a cyclone that's been predicted to hit 
the Australian coastline, Raphael, what are the kind of things that you would need to do to prepare for this um, for the cyclone coming? Thank you, Peter. I think, you know, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, uh, and uh, you'd be surprised how often, you know, uh, 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 there is a complete lack of, you know, baselining. Uh, so uh, basically establishing the baseline of the current infrastructure. I've been working a lot with uh, several cyclones and hurricanes across uh, Pacific Islands and uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, very often, you know, uh, being contacted by the emergency services, uh, Turns out that you know there's absolutely no uh, infrastructure baselining. Uh, there's a lot of talk everywhere about the digital twin, but uh, uh, very very few organisations actually are ready for this type of assessment. So uh, uh, obviously you know you have a different uh, imagery sources, you have a different geospatial data that goes into that, but you know that that. Uh, uh, database that digital twin or whatever you call it you know the the foundation of the of the baseline information is absolutely number one thing that uh, needs to be in place and needs to be up to date because you know uh, a, especially you know post assessment you know after afterwards you know you're trying to uh, estimate the uh, extent of damage and you know you cannot really do that if you don't know what was happening there in the first place uh, Excellent. So what sort of sensors would make a difference? What sort of data outcomes are you wanting and what sort of sensors would you actually use for that sort of um, collection? So uh, there's obviously, you know, uh, you have to start somewhere, you know, uh, you can, you can, uh, uh, there's a uh, lots of data available, you know, uh, in the uh, national emergency management uh, organizations, uh, I mean, GIS data. Uh, the challenge that I see is, you know, those data sets are, are sitting in different silos and, you know, very often uh, like a fire emergency doesn't talk, you know, to, to other organizations and so on. So uh, it's uh, critical to have, you know, the consolidation of those different data sets. When it comes to sensors, you know, uh, you can utilize, you know, the existing uh, aerial imagery that uh, uh, federal governments and state governments have at their disposals, uh, uh, which are complemented by uh, satellite imagery and uh, by other uh, sensors. You have a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, uh, investigations going on through uh, a number of, you know, uh, UAVs and others. I think, Excellent. you know, the, uh, uh, one, one other thing uh, I wanted to add on that point, Peter, as well, is that uh, the weather data, as you know, uh, that's maybe, you know, uh, on the top of the GIS, you know, nobody's really looking on the weather data. So you really need to have the like US has really nailed it. Uh, they have a really good weather forecasting system. So uh, that will be also something that is critical to have. Excellent. Okay, that's um, fantastic. Now, I'd like to sort of suggest that now the uh, cyclone has hit Brisbane, and just like Dorian, we're expecting a storm surge of about five metres. It's probably a little bit unfair, Nathan, because you're from Perth, but what are the kind of things that you would, um, uh, what would you what would you do? What would what would you instigate um, in this event? We've now got the cyclone hitting Brisbane. Yeah, and following on from from Raphael's comments, uh, the, the first thing for the first pass assessment for first responders is really those um, early models of of likely impact. And as Raphael mentioned before, that really relies on having a lot of that infrastructure and population information available. And that's the key first data product to try and identify where the likely impact is going to be to coordinate response efforts. Um, and that will evolve. So as, as you mentioned before, Pete, as you come across Brisbane, go down to Sydney and then to Melbourne, that information evolves all the time. And it's important to keep those models up to date for first responders. Um, and then as the, the events progress, you move from doing those models into actually what's happened on ground. Um, and that's really the great opportunity for remote sensing data to provide intelligence. So then we're looking at impact and damage assessments. So if we're looking at a five metre storm surge, as you mentioned, Pete, you're looking at infrastructure and population really combined with the event coverage and severity to try and identify where response is required. And more so what we saw with the work we did in the Pacific, Pete, was the need for real-time or near real-time communication of activities. Once you get different organisations involved and in some situations, different languages, the use of map-based communication is such a really effective way of communicating current state. So you've got those type of processes required and the need to access centralised information. 
what we tend to see here is an inundation of data. So it won't be just UAV, it won't be fixed wing, it won't just be satellite, it'll be all of the above. And it will really depend on the extent of the, um, of the event. So the challenge then becomes how to use that information effectively and not just for visual um, display, but also how do you actually use it to get the analytics required, which we see is the most significant challenge for disaster response at the moment is, is really that end-to-end -end supply chain and use of that data to give you the analytics and information you require. Um, and that happened, so going off target a little bit, but with the, the bushfires in Australia earlier this year, is um, the inundation of data that was available from a number of different vendors and the need to be able to consolidate those workflows to get the most out of that data. Sure. Okay. Um, so the next one is uh, uh, we've got the cyclone now moving down the coast. And uh, Robert, it's about to hit Sydney, and it's probably the most challenging thing to go and consider Sydney because I think it, it's bad enough when it hits Brisbane, but, um, but we're all, I'm actually from Brisbane, and we actually have our, our housing and our infrastructure has a cyclone rating. But if you have something like that hitting Sydney, there's a whole bunch of different things, I imagine. What do you expect? Um, the storm surge for Dorian was 7.4 metres at this stage. So what do you expect to have to do and, um, you know, what actions? Yeah, it's it's really comes down. If you look at what um, Raphael said with the baselining is you really want to be pulling a lot of the original data that you've acquired, be it one year old, one month old, even 10 year old data is going to have some value depending on obviously on the type of data. Um, unfortunately for Sydney, it's not cyclone rated. So, you know, number one is there's going to be a hell of a lot of debris flying around. Um, but realistically, you're going to have a combination of um, Flooding, you're going to have a combination of inundation with, with water. Um, you're going to have a, a tremendous amount of rainfall, I would suspect, hitting um, to the east of the of the Blue Mountains because the, the rain's going to hit that and just sort of bounce back. Um, you're probably going to have to rely a lot on the Bureau of Meteorology and I mean, obviously things like the weather company from IBM with their analysis and saying, right, show us what water levels we're getting in. Then you're going to have to really have an underlying understanding of um, I'd probably say a DTM, um, or uh, um, just a, a basic terrain understanding, so you can work out where the water's going to go. You're going to need to know um, river speeds, river flow patterns, what the tide level's going to be. All of that's going to impact it. And at the same time, since we've probably had a day to two days, probably two days warning, because Brisbane's gone to hell in a handbasket, and we're sort of able to sit there going, ha-ha, look at them, and, and it's coming down towards us, you're probably going to be able to be a little bit more prepared in what I'd call um, the recovery process. Even though it won't take effect, you'll be able to begin to stockpile resources and and basic requirements that can actually sit back on high ground in safe areas. Um, and then it's really about saying, right, what do we have to do first? What do we need to get up and running first? Um, you have probably at this point, you know, a day out from it hitting Sydney, you've probably, hopefully, the government's done a test on the radio network because, you know, run every, every radio at once because usually the radios all go down together because of overuse. Um, so it's probably a good idea that you've got 24 hours ahead of time to run some very, very quick scenarios for yourself. Um, you're probably going to lose at seven and a half metres. You're going to lose a lot of the eastern coast of the North Shore of Sydney. Um, those million dollar holiday homes will be half a million dollar sand piles, I think, by the end of the storm surge. But you're going to start to lose a lot of road infrastructure, um, power infrastructure. So that's probably what you've bulk stacked back up, um, further back up the hills um, above Sydney, ready to roll out um, generators, everything else, just to get power down there so you can start to do the recovery process. Um, although it might be a bit more difficult with satellite because of the cloud, um, you would have the planes like we have at Aerometrics, you'd have the drones ready to go. Um, and you basically have those people up doing captures, doesn't have to be extremely accurate, um, bosses might get me to me saying that the aim is to get as much data as quickly as possible and then you start to finesse that data on day two day three day four um, you'd be looking to generate a lot of knowledge from i would say at this stage the artificial intelligence organization um, the universities what you can achieve in the us iag suncorp the major insurance players already have a lot of that data there they can start to then sit down and say right let's assess what was what's changed run some change detection 
get that data to the emergency services team as quickly as possible so they know we can't go through you know narrow beam we've got to go up around via St Ives and come down through you know the Wake Coast Parkway or somewhere else to get to some areas because there will be heavily isolated areas um, roads will be gone people will be panicking um, it really will be I think would say the first 24 hours will be just control of emotion and then it's let's start to roll it out uh, because mm -hmm. it's not a lot you're going to be able to do for that first 12 to 24 hours right out the storm have everything ready to go and literally follow the storm down the coast uh, even above Sydney Gosford Gosford would be a good indication of what's going to happen to a lot of Sydney um, that's about 20 30 or 50 k's north depending if you go by road or as the crow flies so you could start to roll out those solutions coming down the coast as the storm slowly moves south um, but there's a lot of rivers there's going to be a lot of water places like Narrabeen Lakes are just going to go they're you know at seven and a half meter storm surge it's tidal um, you get a lot of there's going to be a lot of flooding back there so the roads will be gone um, it's yeah it's going to require getting all the sensors together all the data together I think the government would probably be first off probably two days out they'd be going to a lot of the data suppliers saying we're going to buy the data here's the open source contract deliver it get it to us and they're going to have to probably set up redundant data centers because they would not have experienced this so they're going to literally have to have two centers ready to go and be able to move team between it um, and once the storm goes you've probably got about 24 hours after the storm's gone is when you can start to bring up the satellite um, and that's going to give you a much um, okay a coarser view of what's there but it's going to give you a much wider view of any potential damage and then you can start to send the planes the drones and everything to really start to pinpoint where we got urgent need and start to prioritize the work from there okay so um uh, i guess i'll i'll just ask the team uh, we're looking for data now to assist with where we put emergency response people and we've discussed mainly optical satellites Raphael or anybody is there just optical available to us or is there other options or opportunities for sensors that um, we might be able to use you can use some radar sensors as well you know they're helpful especially during the storm events you know and uh, uh, you know uh, cloud cover because you can see through the clouds uh, although you know uh, uh, it's just only you know certain type of objects uh, that can be detected using uh, radar type of satellites but uh, I think you know very important you know uh, except you know the, of the optical and uh, there's a next generation of satellites coming hopefully soon uh, hyperspectral ones that, that will be a complete game changers as well for for uh, this type of uh, recovery uh, services but uh, really I think you know the critical part here is you know there's a whole bunch of meteorological satellites available and uh, very few people are actually looking into combining you know those different data sets into one powerful you know uh, database of information usually you know like you mentioned bomb you know sits on their own data sets you know they do they day weather modeling but you know uh, it has no uh, uh, interpolation into uh, uh, you know, uh, traditional models, you know, built on the infrastructure side and where are the biggest impacts. So uh, that, that, that's something that is quite important. And, you know, sure. looking forward for the future for those new generation of satellites to come up in the in, in the meantime, I think, you know, best we can do is just, you know, uh, utilizing existing technologies and, you know, uh, uh, all the all the where uh, all the available uh, uh, agencies. OK, so um... Thank you very much, everybody, for your uh, responses there. But I just want to move on now. With the cyclone has passed, we've got obviously a huge humanitarian crisis right up and down the coast of Australia, where 90% of us live, and we have a next problem, which is the recovery. Who's involved in the recovery? What sort of agencies? What sort of companies? And where you know who who's going to need data and what do they need? So maybe I'll throw this over to Nathan to start with. Yeah, thanks, Pete. So the recovery effort will largely be um, concentrated in government agencies. Um, and in terms of what they need, so depending on the size of the event, in this type of event, you'd expect that the um, International Charter on Space and Major Disasters to be mobilised, which will actually provide a mountain of information from satellite vendors to actually help with recovery efforts. But then it's all around still understanding those impact areas so they can coordinate some of those response activities. Um, and where we've seen a significant challenge is 
consolidating a lot of the information products. So in this particular example, we're looking at flood extents. So being very consistent in how you can integrate, and I think Rob mentioned this point as well, how to integrate multiple data sources to get consistent data products that are then used for the emergency response activities by government agencies. Um, and the main, that's whilst that's quite a challenge, it's the opportunity to use, say, cloud technology to really operationalize some of these outputs at scale. I think that's the key activity to be able to coordinate all of the government agencies. So you're looking at a centralized point of truth and centralized data products that are consistently used. And then the other side to that equation is, yes, you've got the response and recovery efforts by government agencies, but then it's how you communicate that to um, the public as well. And being able to put some of these data products on extent um, into mediums that make sense for the everyday user. Because really that's where the value is, is trying to get this information in the hands of the people that need it in the best way possible. Okay, um, Robert, You've um, talked a lot about aggregating these data sets and, and doing the analysis. Um, but for the general person, as Nathan was getting to, they, they need it into a more consumable or a transparent environment. What sort of information would the, I guess, somebody who's been affected by the flood um, from a uh, remote sensing kind of environment that we can provide them to, to improve their, I guess, their recovery from this, um, from this event? Okay, so they're going to go through a few phases. They're going to obviously, the first couple of days, it's going to be, where am I, what have I got, where can I go, what information can I acquire? So the government at that point, um, probably in conjunction with the insurance companies, because they do get access to very quick data, they would probably be sitting down and saying, right, how do we get the main requirements out to the, the consumer? Um, you're probably going to have to make sure that the telcos are behind this sort of support because the customer is going to usually access this through their mobile phone. Um, I doubt they're going to be using their laptops because um, they may well have left those in their homes or in their cars that are six feet underwater. So you're going to have to make sure that everything is made available simply. Um, there's tools you can get now where you can actually go down and, and identify your home and what's the bushfire risk. So you can potentially go, what's the flood risk for my home? I can sit there and look at it and say, right, I'm safe. We've got a stream coming. I've got 14 hours and I've got an alert has come out to me saying I've got 14 hours to clear out my house um, or to move area to high ground and it's projected I've got to get to a certain height level. Um, for the people that are on the coast that have probably lost their homes, um, they're more likely to see where am I going to stay. I'm in, I'm in the centre, um, I'm at a rescue or a safe location, um, how long am I going to be there for, when can I get back and at least assess and grieve the loss of my, my location but then recover what I can and then slowly get to um, so a lot of that data that's going to come in will be required for insurance, for government, for inspectors and for assessors. But out of that, you'll start to draw some key defining components that are going to be critical for um, comfort is probably the, the key word that's going to need to go to the residencies. Um, then they're going to need reassurance and comfort that um, this time will pass, what the problems they've got are being assessed properly, adequately and at a, at a speed that they're happy with. Um, not everyone's going to be happy, but the majority will be happy. Um, and so you're going to be quite selective in that data and you're probably not going to know the right data set till probably the second or third day because you're going to get it wrong at times. So you start to pick and choose what the data sets and the data sets for the people up in Penrith or Parramatta that are dealing with the flooding is going to be different for the data sets for people down in Manly and Cronulla and everywhere else that are experiencing the coastal damage. Um, and so those, those realistically, the people will probably be able to have a, a, a list of what they can pick from and the data will be flowing in from the government and the, um, the organisations that are there to help to say, right, here's what we would do. The Red Cross would have something in there. So if I've lost my home, but it's only through flooding, not destruction, you might go to Red Cross and get a certain access point. Um, so a lot of the not-for-profits are going to play a key role in that first day or two of engaging with the people with the data. And they're more likely to know from their experience what's the information that people will want. So what the government and industry is going to need to be able to do is to say, once we supply the data to those emergency sectors inside government or not for profit, we would probably say that, you know, we would have people in there saying, right, you want me to pull an algorithm out to give that piece of data, bang, I'll pull it out and I'll present it to those people in this format. Um, but more than likely it'll be through mobile phone. I mean, even, you've even got the case of get, identifying people, birth, deaths, marriages, that, that's gone. You'll assume that's gone, it's been flooded out. Um, 
So that's going to have to be able to be handled by people on mobile phones. So yeah, like COVID, everybody be working from almost home. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So look, we're going to open it up for some questions now. Um, what you like? What the questions being managed through the chat feature? So if you have a um, a question, please uh, type it into the chat feature now, and um, we'll get it to the the panel. And while we're doing that, um, uh, I'd just like to ask the panelists while we're waiting for the first question to come up. We've got a um, uh, a couple of indication that there's going to be a, a kind of a, a mobile workforce, an app or whatever. And you're now, you know, two years after the tropical cyclone Dorian hits and you're standing in front of a, a property that's on the beach of the northern coast of uh, Sydney. And you know that during this cyclone event, it, um, it used to, it didn't used to be beachfront. <laughs> Something else was beachfront. And this was the house behind it. How do you, you know, how do you cope with, um, like, what are the information sources that I'm going to get from an insurance company? Um, there's already insurance companies that don't actually insure um, northern Australia. They won't insure houses north of Rockhampton. They, they are de-risking their profiles. And we haven't mentioned the term yet, but there's obviously a, a switch here that is based on climate change, which is causing these uh, the frequency and intensity of these, these events. The insurance financial, which is do I have, do I, am I going to wear that risk or how do I deal with that risk? How do you see that sort of information um, uh, from a, a uh, from an insurance and a person who's insuring, insuring their property point of view, translating into an app or a search for a house or something like that. So I'm now after the event, now looking for a house. I love the idea of a beach view. This house is in my property, but I now want to go and have a look at, you know, what data sets am I looking for and how do I get that information? Do you want to have a go at that, Raphael? Uh, Just quickly, because we only got a couple of minutes. No worries. Yeah, I think uh, this goes back to this uh, databasing and uh, baselining, uh, this digital twin. So uh, to answer your question here, to answer the, the audience question, uh, insurance companies are only starting looking into the geospatial data sets. They haven't done it very well up until now, uh, but there's definitely a movement and trend in trying, you know, to, to categorizing, you know, the risk zones and uh, following up, you know, the discussions with the different councils and uh, state uh, governments into uh, uh, for the average Joe to be able, you know, OK, so I can look here on the map that is published, you know, by by the state government and see, OK, am I buying a house, you know, in the risk zone or not? And, you know, will I be able to insure it? Uh, and just, you know, as a coincidence, just only yesterday here in New Zealand, insurance companies has announced that, you know, uh, all the 450,000 houses uh, alongside, you know, the, the cost of New Zealand, you know, uh, uh, the insurance premium will either go up or half of them will not be able to insure at all because they don't exactly. want to risk themselves. So um, we've got about two minutes left. Have you got any closing remarks, um, Robert? Um, yeah, I, I think it's more about it's I think what you'll find is change will take time. Change will take time from the data we get and change will take time for the climate to, it'll get worse, but it'll, it'll fl fluctuate. I think what's more important than anything else is that there is that need to establish a solid baseline now, um, be it for bushfire, be it for disaster management, be it for, for anything realistically. And I think that's where some of the digital twin work is probably gonna play a key role in driving that. Um, and it's really about sort of identifying um, scenarios where, you know, I mean, if you think about it, councils that are along the coastline are going to run out of money eventually because houses will be worth nothing and they'll have no money. So there's a lot of change that's coming and the only way to judge that change is from a baseline. So as Raphael said, it's that's probably the most important thing from today is we need to establish a solid baseline of all facets of the, of the environment. Thank you. And Nathan, closing remarks from yourself? Yeah, following on from Rob, it, it is that baseline information and we've seen um, previous issues with hurricanes in Puerto Rico where they identified the key um, challenge was the lack of that information to be able to coordinate disaster response activities. So that's crucial um, for us. The key challenge we're seeing, as I mentioned before, is really the use of all of the different information products 
and to be able to streamline those processes to deliver the outputs required. I think that's that's the real opportunity, particularly for government currently, to take advantage of that. Excellent. Okay, so from I think we're right on the hour now. Um, I think that's where we're supposed to be. So I'd like to thank everybody that participated in the, the call today. I'd like to thank particularly our presenters and the opportunity that we've had to um, share this with you today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. Well done. Thank, Thanks, you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Robert. you. Thanks, Raphael. Thanks, Bye. Nathan. Bye.